Hello, my name is Dave Diamond. I'm an artist from Toronto. Uh, the piece that I'm presenting here at the Walper as part of Kafka is titled The Morning Has Gold in Its Mouth, um, which actually comes from the alternate take of Stanley Kubrick's film The Shining. The title comes from uh, an instance in which they shot five or six different versions for international audiences. So in the Italian, Jack types the phrase that translates to the morning has gold in its mouth and it's a different sort of aphorism for each country. Uh, the famous English one is of course all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So I had been saving uh, write fan writings about the film The Shining for almost a couple of years now. And then when you asked me to come here and consider responding to the Walper Hotel, it just seemed to make sense given the sort of crazy hallways here and the carpets and maybe a bit of the history of the hotel. A big part of the sort of conspiracy theories around the film are a series of continuity errors that, I mean, I mean are, are quite common in most films. People maintain that Kubrick it was so meticulous that he never ma didn't make any mistakes. So if there is an inconsistency in the film, it's not there because they were just in a hurry that day or they had to pick up a shot or you know the set burned down which it actually did and they had to recreate it and maybe when they recreated it something was you know shifted a couple of inches. They maintain that all of these things are intentional and that they're t designed to unnerve the audience or to give away various clues, um, that you're sort of depending on the conspiracy theorist. They're there for various reasons. So I thought it would be funny to have a number of sort of live uh, continuity errors within the hotel. So for one, there's the lenticular mirror, which reflects a bookshelf on my left um, and a stack of five encyclopedias, which are all, all, always here. And in one, the sort of an animated lenticular, one has the st a stack of five books and the other has four with one on its side, which is a you know, very common continuity error in a lot of movies in which the, the, the books behind the person uh, who is being focused on will shift in various ways. And there's dozens of those in The Shining, from books all of a sudden looking newer than they looked the before, or to them leaning one direction and leaning another. But these are just things that we found here on site. And the second is, uh, I really sort of wanted to engage the staff a little bit. So I've made eight light, uh, like little um, light switch plates and installed them with magnets around various spaces in the hotel. And the idea is to appeal to the cleaning staff and you know various administrative staff in the hotel and ask them to move them around from day to day. So you, you prob most people would not notice them because they're pretty innocuous, but if it's right outside your hotel room, or say you're standing and you're waiting for the, the elevator and you happen to notice this light switch, and then when you get back from your dinner, the light switch is no longer there. It's you know, 10 doors down somewhere else. Um, it's a sort of a piece for the subconscious more than anything else, because I don't think it would register with a lot of people, um, but it may serve to sort of highlight this other aspect of the hotel, which I've uh, noticed a few things about. It's, it almost forms a, a, a number eight, I think, the architectural floor plan of this floor. Of the, we're on the fourth floor of the hotel here. Um, so it becomes this nice infinity symbol. Uh, I know that when I was walking around looking for spaces to install the books, I ended up kind of you know, repeating myself several times or I could, my partner was in here, here shooting photographs and I could hear her speaking, but I couldn't quite see her and I would, I would loop around. So yeah, there's definitely that. And again, in the film The Shining, they refer to that when Shelley Duvall's character is being led through at the very beginning, she says, oh, I could, I could get lost in this place, I'll have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs, which also sort of refers back to the end scene of the film in which the boy is chased by his father with an axe through the maze, and he, he sort of uh, steps back in his own foot, like leap, reverses into his own footprints so that his father can't find him. Um, so definitely that, that sort of all played into it as well. But yeah, that's, that, that might, you might even forget your room number, but you know that it's the one that has a light switch because none of the others do. So the continuity error pieces, the light, the light switches and the mirror are ultimately here in aid of the, the bookwork project, which is, as you can, I think, see behind me, it's a four volume set. I think the, to the page number totals 1,740 and it's essentially every single frame from the film The Shining, you know, every different scene, which has been annotated not by me, I've just collected them, but by uh, the, the fans who have these really arcane theories. 
and they range from believing that the film is a parody of Stephen King's novel, not, or, um, not a film version, but a, but a film parody. Others argue that the, the movie is intended to be played backwards. Other people maintain that the whole reason Kubrick made the film was to show you thousands and thousands of images of bears. There's a, there's a two hour long YouTube clip in which he'll highlight all of these bears that you sort of see in the shadows. Several people argue quite uh, powerfully that the film is an apology by Kubrick and a confession that he has staged the moon landing. That after making the film 2001, NASA contacted him and said, we want to tell the American people we've gone to the moon, so we want you to cinematically stage that for us. And that the, he was embarrassed about that, and he was just sort of ashamed of it, and then 10 years later, however many years later, he, uh, he made The Shining as a confession. And so there are scenes like, Danny wears an Apollo 11 shirt, uh, and you know, a couple of things that, that maybe are strong enough anchor points, but then there's also just like any time the number 11 appears in the film, these people maintain that's a super clue. So they'll count like the specks of dust on the ground and say there's 11 in this frame, therefore it's a reference to Apollo 11. I mean, the easiest way to dispel most of these theories is that uh, the technology that's available now that allows us to unearth them ranging from high definition Blu-ray that lets us zoom right in and all of a sudden we know what's appearing on a background bulletin board. But even more importantly, just the ability to review a film. Because in 1980, VCRs were kind of just becoming commonplace. Not, not even, I would say they were just introduced around that time and most households did not have them. So the idea that Kubrick made a film that could only be understood by watching it frame by frame, and that's the way these people have watched these fil this film, they, often they've counted the frames. And so some of the books, some of the pages reference uh, that the length of frames, the length of the number of seconds that a particular scene is. And if it's 42, well then wow, they're onto something. If it's 11, then there's the answer to this mystery, and so on. But yeah, that. You know, Blu-rays, DVD players, even VCRs were certainly not around at that time. There was an impulse initially to produce it as a film piece, as a video work, that would appear on the hotel's uh, own channel, so that like at two in the morning when people are typically you know, surfing the hotel's channel for porn or whatever, they would find this film instead. But there was something about the book form that just, it, it lets you measure it in a way. Like that's how I see the piece really being experienced. Not that someone, no one's gonna sit and read the whole, I mean, I mean, maybe, I guess I read the whole book, but my partner hasn't read the whole book. Um, who wants to sit in a hotel lobby and read 1,700 pages? But I think you could sit down, you could flip through, you could get a sense, and then you could, to me the important, the, the, the thing beyond the conspiracies, the thing that really interests me is this idea of a culture that's been so examined. Like that, that there's a film out there, this is probably not the only one, in which every single frame has been dissected by fans and discussed, and then that's formed this, this secondary culture. That's so, you know, the, the conspiracy is almost just the, the Trojan horse to, to look into the piece, but I really like this idea um, that, that we spend that much time, that like people have spent, Certain fans who've, who've developed these series have probably spent more time with this movie than Stanley Kubrick did making it, or than Stephen King did writing it, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that they've devoted their lives to the examination of a film. And it's not unlike people, you know, who maintain that Bruce Lee and Elvis are still alive, or that, um, you know, J who, who killed JFK, but this is something of zero consequence. It's just a movie. It's just a dumb horror movie adapted from a dumb Pulp Fiction novel, right? Um, but it seems very timely at the same time. Like two weeks ago, we had the, the Boston Marathon bombings, and immediately there were Twitter notices from people like Alex Jones and Glenn Beck and like really right-wing talk show hosts implying that something was fishy. Like, oh, I don't know, I think the government did this because they want to take away our guns, or like there's, or, or the Saudi national that they first caught, he, you know, the, the, they asked him a couple of questions in the hospital. He said, no, I was just running. They said, oh yeah, you're right. Your alibi check said, see you later. And because that was reported by the New York Post one day and not reported the next, they think that they've discovered something. They think that, you know, Obama made a deal with a Saudi prince to let his family member through or, you know, whatever, whatever their imaginations uh, and their paranoia kind of lead them to. 
these are really in the air right now. I read just yesterday that 44% of Republicans think we might need an armed revolution to overthrow our government. Like that's nearly half and more than that, less than that disagree. 44% maintain yes, 26% say no or something along those lines.